Hey everyone, I am here with Andreas Antonopoulos. Andreas, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. So Andreas, we are here talking about the concept of decentralized power. Mm -hmm. So I love the two terms clashing because it's so contradictory. Decentralized yeah. power. When we think of power, you know, whether you're reading 48 Laws of Power or other powerful books, the concept is, you know, I am the leader, I should have the power. Right. But the whole notion of decentralized power seems a bit of a conundrum. I was wondering if you can expand a bit more on that. Yeah, so, so the idea is that we now have uh, a basis in technology combining networks, peer-to-peer -peer technologies, and market forces to create very, very scalable platforms for trust and decision-making and governance without leaders, without having a leader, without having concentration of power, uh, and all of the problems that brings but also um, systems that are able to scale to a global scale, to an internet scale, um, to help us you know, look at how society can evolve, because right now a lot of the hierarchical institutions we have simply don't scale for the decision making that's needed in a, in a global society. So um, that's what decentralized power is about. It's, uh, it's about using flat networks, peer-to-peer -peer systems, um, and things like blockchain technology. Uh, to to create new models for governance. I love that. So one of the touching on new models uh, when you're looking at corporations, mm -hmm. one thing is one notable example is Zappos, you know, the holacracy model. Now, they've had some challenges when they have integrated the holacracy model, right. but obviously there are certain advantages. You know, you can move swiftly, everyone's kind of independent, similar to like ants. Yes. Right? So what are you finding with corporations, whether it's you know, startups or mid-cap or large Fortune 500 companies, are they embracing it? Are they resistant to it? Like, what are, in your experience, are you finding with them? I think it's uh, uh, interesting that you mentioned Ants, which happens to be on the front cover of my book, Mastering Bitcoin, and I use the same metaphor, which is that uh, having lots of uh, independent units that uh, collaborate, uh, but do not have a defined hierarchy, which is how an ant colony works, is the model that Bitcoin, blockchains, and other things use. Uh, and biology really doesn't do hierarchies at the scale we as humans do. Um, and there's a reason for that. I think um, we can look at biological examples to learn how to scale better. Um, unfortunately, the corporation as a, an organizing principle today um, is still hopelessly tied to the 15th century <laughs> model that it started with. And um, that means that it's, it's, they're jurisdictionally bound, corporations, um, uh, both in good ways and bad ways. Um, they can be subject to regulations by one government and then escape and run to another jurisdiction to avoid that and uh, you know, essentially become superorganisms. That model for the corporation doesn't scale very well, and I think it's time to re-engineer the concept of a corporation. One of the things that's interesting in the technology and blockchain is you have this uh, model called uh, a decentralized cooperative organization, DCO, or a decentralized autonomous organization. These are essentially um, models for governing groups of people, either through um, a smart contract that basically allows you to have directors and shareholders vote, or you can even take the organizational principles, encode them in, in code, in programming, um, and the corporation is run by the laws of mathematics and, and the code that is in there without directors, without managers, without bosses. Um, it's a loose uh, collaboration of, of people who can use that software. So you might see that technology enables models like Zappos that you mentioned uh, to become more prevalent, um, but there, there will be uh, quite a few challenges with that model. Traditional corporations can't adapt to that, um, and a lot of governments and jurisdictions will have trouble swallowing that uh, as an idea. Um, because you really have a, a new model, which is a completely borderless corporation, right? So how do you manage that? So when you mentioned that corporations can't handle that or they can't adapt to it, should corporations really create a separate organization? What should a, let's just say, a board member at a Fortune 500 company be thinking about? Um, well, it's, it's really hard to say right now because uh, things are changing very, very fast. These technologies are evolving so much faster than the capacity of a hierarchical organization to absorb. 
uh, I think, unfortunately, the truth is that uh, a lot of this involves creative destruction, which means that the old model becomes obsolete uh, and it gradually withers, uh, and new companies, new models, new organizations come in to replace them. Uh, adaptation is very difficult in that kind of competitive environment. Is there an example, perhaps, from past where there was a formal, formal organization structure and they have in essence creatively disrupted into a new kind of autonomous decentralized no okay and I, I think you're gonna find very few examples of that the history of, of uh, innovation is littered with examples of failing to adapt to the changes um, so I think we're going to see some pretty radical changes but it, it's not just because these technologies are evolving or you know you have new things like blockchain technology I think it's because when the model fails to scale, um, it needs to be replaced. So the, problem, the, the thing isn't that new things are coming out that are better, it's also that the old things are no longer working so well. I see. So from a concept, if we take a, if we zoom out the lens a bit, from mm -hmm. a socioeconomic point of view, the role of decentralized power, like you mentioned, it, of course is going to scare our governments, right? Mm -hmm. Because they control a lot of the, the laws and policies, but now from the decentralized power perspective, the benefit is of course a lot from the populace, mm -hmm. right? So I was wondering if you can expand a bit more about that. Well, I think it's uh, interesting that um, the way you phrased that question had uh, governments as separate uh, from the populace, uh, which certainly isn't uh, the intended model. The intended model is government of the people by the people, for the people. Mm -hmm. And and the way you, you say it, I think, reveals what all of us know is that that model isn't actually true. And that um, the, the struck, and that has to do with the architecture of power. It has to do with the fact that representative governments using hierarchical institutions and building up decision-making um, you know, in a hierarchical way don't scale. They can't make decisions fast enough. They can't address the needs of, of localities. The bigger they get, the more further they are removed from the, the people who are affected by these decisions, effectively disenfranchising them uh, from the process. So democracy as implemented in a traditional hierarchy is failing to scale to meet the needs uh, of a global population. And uh, I think that's going to change. Uh, and it's going to change whether governments want it or not, uh, because people are going to gravitate to the systems that work and leave the systems that aren't. And uh, in some cases, you'll see um, we see this again and again in history when when the the prevailing model of governance is threatened, um, governments try to lock everyone into that model and you know <laughs> take them with it. Right. Um, but you know today's world affords more and more people the opportunity to exit, either physically exit through immigration or virtually exit by participating in shadow economies, parallel economies, online economies and communities, uh, local economies and communities that, ha that are disconnected essentially from the national model and plan. Um, more and more people will do that. And part of the reason is that there's now an entire generation of millennials who, um, for whom the current model has nothing to offer. Career? No. Institutions to trust? None. Um, jobs? None. Student loans, plenty. So, you know, in that model, <laughs> right. of course you're going to look for alternatives, and there's nothing anyone can do to stop people from, you know, exploring their own future. Is there a possibility of kind of combining both the concept of decentralized organizations combining with somewhat of a reporting structure? Um, not really. I don't think so. Okay. The reporting structure itself is, is an architecture that doesn't scale, and we've seen that. So, at any size, um, once it reaches a certain size, it stops working efficiently, and then it creates these horrible side effects. Uh, the power that flows to the top corrupts the people in charge. It also attracts sociopaths who rise to the top faster than anybody else. So you end up with a system that is disenfranchising the bottom, is corrupted at the top, is impossible to fix the corruption because that's the same system that's supposed to ensure there is no corruption, and it's the one that's corrupt. And it draws the worst possible sociopaths to climb to the position of CEO or president or you know right. emperor for life. Um, decentralized systems are intentionally designed to not create positions of leadership, and you can't really do a hybrid model between 
uh, the past and the future like that. It's as if almost um, you know, the horse buggy association sees the rise of the new automobile and they say, you know, that's a very nice um, structure. We really like the idea of pneumatic tires, but we have a vested interest in horses. So how about we put the car, but it take out the engine and put a horse in front of it? You're kind of missing the point. I love that. Right? I love that. So I think uh, second last question. So if you're looking at the concept of decentralized power, should new companies start to implement the, the concept of flat organizations starting out? Or should they, when should they start, like should it be five people, 10 people? Is there a, a timeline when they should be thinking about a flat organization? Uh, this is not something that's going to happen from corporations down. It's going to happen from grassroots, from individuals up. It, this, this comes to, down to individuals choosing to participate in an ad hoc governance structure with other people from around the world to pursue a common interest. And it, it's not going to be the traditional corporation. It's not going to have the same timeline. You know, one of the characteristics of corporations is that they're designed to have a moment of inception, uh, a period of life, and effectively they never die, they're never disbanded, or can right. be immortal effectively. And they continue to have more or less a singular purpose. Uh, these new models that we're talking about can emerge, follow a purpose, disband, emerge again, um, merge and separate, uh, attract new participants, have participants leave. It's a much more fluid style of organization, right. which is, of course, much more suitable and agile for today's world. Uh, but you're not going to see a traditional company saying, let us adopt the thing that is the complete antithesis of everything we've been doing so far. Right. You can't do that. And what's a good example of an organization that, that's doing that currently? That's currently doing... That's being um, more fluid. You know, uh, the blockchains themselves are examples of decentralized autonomous organizations. So um, the security of Bitcoin or Ethereum is decided through a consensus arrived by all of the participants every 10 minutes. Uh, and that's an ad hocracy. It's a participatory network. You can join it and leave it anytime you want. It's completely voluntary. Uh, it's not a corporation. It doesn't have uh, a founder. It doesn't have a leader. And and that's by design. So, you know, the currencies themselves are already exhibiting some early stages, but it's still early in this technology. You know, it's going to take a long time uh, for these technologies to be easy enough, secure enough, well understood enough that we're going to start seeing uh, the effect spread to society. Just like it took 25 years for the internet to start influencing elections or right. um, geopolitics or things like that. But we know it's coming. It's just a matter of time. Lovely. Andreas, lastly, where can people go to find out more about you and your book? Um, so uh, you can find me on Twitter, A-A-N-T-O-N-O-P. Uh, you can find me on YouTube and you can find my personal site. Probably the easiest way to do that is just search for Andreas and Bitcoin. There's just one of me here. <laughs> Lovely. Andreas, thank you so much. Thank you so really much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.